Hey, I'm Jesse. Welcome to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they all drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with, with most of them since they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to party. Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in a single day, 23,000 people died. Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. Don't complain, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroyer. These things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages has, have come. Heavy, heavy news. This is not um, this. This is not something I can say with total biblical authority, but it's possible that it's an example of what Paul's talking about here. I've seen this where God's letter in my heart: if this guy doesn't repent, I'm going to take him out. All right, and uh, I can I can count on three fingers the times in which the Lord laid that on my heart, and that person has passed away. So I open my Bible again to say with biblical authority that Paul uses the example of the Israelites. You don't you don't test God. Right, God has the ability. He has taken his own people out in the past. Don't put it past God to take you out. If you are defaming the gospel by professing Christ, but living in a way that is completely antithetical to it, do not put it past God to do what he did with his Old Testament people. He said, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors, they were all under the cloud. Okay, that, that cloud, that pillar of cloud that indicated the, the movement of the presence of the Lord guiding them across the Exodus sands. They all passed through the sea. Remember the parting of the Red Sea and then the other side of the Exodus and the second generation of the Israelites, the crossing of the miraculously parted Jordan River. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We referred to this verse in our teachings about the ordinances like baptism. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. Right, this is going to come up as well in chapter 11. In the next chapter, he's going to give some pretty heavy hitting instructions on communion. So that's, going to, that's, going to, uh, that's a theme he's introducing. There's a lot of cohesion to the book of 1 Corinthians, even as it covers a large litany of issues that were brought to, uh, brought to Paul's attention. He even refers, this is a Christophany, he refers to the rock as Christ. Moses was not allowed to see the promised land. And it comes down to how he struck the rock that allowed the water to flow from it and what he said when he did it. He took credit for what God was doing when he did that. And as a result, he missed out on the promised land. He welcomed it from a distance. Now, at the end of his life, he celebrated as a hero. All of our spiritual heroes in the Old Testament have deep flaws, but we, we still love them. And Moses is one of these. And his eulogy at the end, uh, it, it's incredible just to behold how he never lost his vigor. He loved the Lord. It's in, he's, he's honored even as he misses out on the final blessing. Hebrews 11 uh, also it preserves him in the annals of those who are to be remembered for their incredible faith, but he, re he welcomed these things from a distance. He didn't receive all that blessedness in his lifetime. I mean, God's discipline can be harsh, especially for those of us who are in leadership. We're judged more strictly Moses welcomed it from a distance. This rock incident during the Exodus, Paul refers to that as a Christophany. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them since they were struck down in the wilderness. So we already see mass casualties throughout the course of the 40 years in the desert. These things took place as examples for us so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Don't become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to party or to dance, if you will. All right, this is this is not just about partying in, in, in general. Uh, this is a reference to Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in a single day, 23,000 people died. These are the people of God. They're committing sexually immoral acts. 
They're the covenant Israelites, the chosen people of God. 23,000 of them died. Do you remember the context for John 3.16? Everybody loves John 3.16. We all know John 3.16, but John 3 verses 14 and 15 are less known. They're a reference back to what Paul also alluded to in this text, where God was disciplining his people. He was harsh toward his people. He released these venomous snakes upon them. And there was this bronze snake that was lifted up. And if they looked to that, the very source of their affliction, they would be saved. We looked to Christ on the cross, taking upon himself the cost of our sin, the very source of our affliction, will be saved. Just as Moses lifted up the bronze snake in the desert, so the Son of Man, that's Jesus, must be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that all who believe in him would not die but have everlasting life. That example comes up here, the original bronze snake that provided the backdrop to the cross in John 3.16. Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. I love this one, verse 10. This is the pastor's favorite verse. And don't complain, some of them did and were killed by the destroyer. I'm going to put that over the welcome desk in the lobby at our church building. <laughs> Do, don't complain. Don't complain. You're following God. You're, you're following him. These things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. So it, God has authored history. It's all his story. He does what he says he will do. You don't complain about the direction that he's taken you. You don't revile him. You don't commit blatant acts of sexual morality and idolatry and expect not to be disciplined by God. And God is fully within his right. It's fully his prerogative as the author and giver of life to take it away. I've seen God do this before. Paul reminds the church of Corinth of the same exact thing. He's God. Who are we to correct him? His discipline can be harsh, but his glorification lasts forever. His anger with his people also does abate. It does not last forever. See the prophet Isaiah. There does come a time where your disgrace is replaced with grace. In the examples that he gives, we have flagrant complaining against God, disobedience unto him, worshiping of idols and rampant sexually immoral practices given with zero intention of ever repenting. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. And then he's well within his rights to take us out if we defame the gospel by our stubborn, dogged unrepentance. I have seen this before, it's true. Paul was right to warn the church of Corinth. And with a heavy heart, share it with you too, my friend. Would you walk in repentance and grace instead?